first part there. Okay, well, um, I'm Pastor Rocky Randall from Iola Baptist Temple, and uh, uh, joining again for the second time, Brother David uh, uh, Ray, and I just want to let everybody know that we we talked for an hour and 14 minutes, I think it was last Yeah, it was night. a great conversation. Great conversation, <laughs> and now we get to do it again because it didn't record uh, uh, properly and everything, so uh, I sure appreciate you being willing to go through that again. Oh, it's uh, not a problem. I, I enjoy it. So, uh, so I'm talking to Brother David Ray, and I was just have you. I know we'll say a lot of the same things we did yesterday. Maybe even hit some new stuff. You never know. <laughs> but, it's, uh, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> right. But uh, so, but, but just tell you me, and I will know. No one else yeah. will know. <laughs> there you go. Well, they won't now because I just told them. <laughs> but uh, so, just tell the people where you are a missionary to. And a little bit about that field there. Yeah, I'm a missionary to uh, Zambia, Africa. We're located in the capital city of Lusaka. It's 2 million people. Uh, Zambia, Africa is uh, about 15 million people now. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's an urban church plant, basically. Okay. And uh, so the reason I called you and uh, wanted to talk to you about this is because I realized as we were doing our uh, uh Missions Month is what we're calling them, the month of March. We're focusing on worldwide evangelism. And so in doing so, we, we're studying the different um, regions, linking up different continents and what have you, and just doing a little bit of uh, giving a little information to the people. And the purpose is to look at the missionaries that we have on the field and be praying for them and just to recognize the great need and, and what they're doing out there and everything. And so last week we did, we just combined the Americas, North and South America, and, uh, and everything in that whole side of the world, uh, this whole side of the world. And uh, we combined all that together, and, and obvious, for obvious reasons, the most of our missionaries that we support are in the, uh, this region. And uh, it was something like, when we looked at the total population, it was something like 970. Uh, million or something like yeah. that, which, which is pretty significant. But then this month, we're doing just the continent of Africa. And I know that sound, I mean, when I say that, just the continent of Africa, you know, we've probably all seen the pictures where they take the North America and they stick it in the continent yeah. two times, you know, so yeah, we know it's huge. It's huge. It's massive. Yeah. But in our Western th way of thinking here, I, I think often we you know, I, I have folks in our church that are, have hardly ever left Kansas. You know, yeah. so to them, we the rest of the world seems small in a way. You know, in a way. So anyway, the other thing is when you look at the way they take a map. You know, a map the globe's round, and when you put it on right. a flat map, it it uh, shrinks the center and expands the top. So Russia looks yeah. Russia's big, but it looks bigger. Alaska's big, but it looks right. bigger. And the ones along the equator get compressed in essence. So, the yeah. the square miles or square kilometers is is uh, it's hard to estimate sometimes because we're used to right. looking at that traditional flat. Well, map. I, think, I think Google Google Earth started showing a picture of the whole globe when you go on. I don't know if you've ever gone there. And yeah, looked, I, have. But I have. It shows a little more proportionately, and, and yeah, you can really see that. So, we estimated uh, just looking up some uh, research online that in Whereas uh, all the Americas together was uh, whatever I said, not uh, like 970 million or something like that. Just in the continent of Africa, it was like 1.5 uh, billion. And it's so, growing. It's the fastest growing uh, demographic in the world. Yeah, right, right. And that makes sense because in Western way of thinking, it seems like, you know, hey, it's all about my, my life. And so I'm going to limit myself to one or two kids, if that. And so... Rest of the world doesn't have that mind that mindset, it's, right? And a lot of the yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, the average is maybe six children per family in Africa. Oh wow, yeah. So and, uh, uh, you've got resources there. I think. Well, I wish I'd had all these statistics ready, but I think uh, six of the ten fastest growing cities are in Africa. Um, oh, a significant number of the fastest growing economies now are in Africa. And when you look at the population statistics for what like uh, Lagos, Nigeria is supposed to be in 20 years or 30 years, it's like New York City size. 
I mean, the, right. the populations are just exploding and there's massive. No well, to give you an example, I started this whole thing in 2011 when uh, when we began to start our deputation process. We're at 2019 now. When when I looked at the population then, it was 12 point something million. And now we're pushing on 16 million. Right. And, right. and so just since I've been there, we've just added, you know, an extra three million people in Zambia. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, you think about I, I think about that from a missionary standpoint and I'm thinking, OK, great. I get on my field now. I'm going to reach Zambia. And there's three million more people now than when I started. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. That's right. That's a it's a it's a huge jump for sure. And, and so we recognize that. And, and I looked at, you know, the, we've, we've got to thinking back. We've had several missionaries that we supported that were on the field of Africa somewhere. You know, we had somebody in South Sudan, had somebody in Kenya. Uh, we've had a couple of, in the Ivory Coast, uh, different places around there. But, you know, for one reason or another, health problems or maybe uh, some government, uh, you know, issues or whatever where they had to come back to the States. And currently we only support one missionary in the entire continent of Africa and he's actually not on the field right now because he had some eye problems and stuff like that. And so I just realized that, man, there there really is a great need. And I realize there's a lot of great missionaries in Africa. But yeah, I'm talking is. about there certainly is. our contact. Yeah, but our contacts and who I'm familiar with, uh, I'm realizing that, man, there's a great uh, need there and not so many laborers maybe. <laughs> that's yeah, what we would, it's, would like to see. Um, and I know that's I'm worldwide. biased because that's where my heart is. So I, I just put that disclaimer out. I'm biased. But um, I look at it as you go where the fishing's good. You go yeah, where right. the you go where the people are that the, they want to hear. And um, right. the 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 great thing about Africa is there is an openness to the gospel. There is a willingness to have a conversation. You can walk down the street, and I can stop people on the street. I can hand them a track. I can start to talk to them about Christ, and I can witness to them, and they will stop, and they will sincerely listen. They will take a track, and they will read it. And, um, you know, and, and, and they'll get saved and you'll see people saved. And that is a fantastic thing for a missionary because that's what we're all about, right? And seeing people yeah. come to a knowledge of Christ and the ability to be able to do it and to do it often and to be able to do it frequently mm -hmm. and to be able to do it until you can't speak anymore because your voice is wore out is really a big benefit on a mission field. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, God bless the people going to Germany. Those Germans need Christ. There's no question about mm -hmm. it. But the idea of just working so long for for what you know and again this right. is this gets a controversial you know for a marginal return you know i've been there for 20 sure. years and there's 20 people in the church um and god yeah. bless them because you know what those 20 people need to get saved and every soul is right. worth it but then part of me is like we've got areas of the country that would receive the gospel and that want the gospel and the people want to know and, you know, I'm sitting in Seattle right now, Pacific Washington, in my pastor's office. And, um, you know, the church here is growing. They're seeing people saved. But, man, when you go out and knock on doors, they slam the door in your face. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. You know, guy looks at you and says, I'm a homosexual. Why do I want to go to church? Slams the door. You know, and, and I look at him. I say, God bless him for doing the work he's doing here. I don't want to do it. He comes to Africa, looks what we deal with and says, God bless you, brother. I don't want to live here. So. Right. And I do believe God gives people a different different burden, you know, Absolutely. so I, I, you know, I'm not going to criticize the people, but I, I'm with you just logically. I'm thinking, you know, you know, people go to a field and here's something else we can talk about, I'm sure, but people go to the field and, and they literally their, their first four year term or whatever, the entire thing is just learning the language. Yeah. You know, they're not even witnessing to anybody really because, well, because they, they can't. <laughs> Yeah, and and, then, so, and that's and that's I looked at this thing. I, I I got I'm a late late bloomer, I guess, in the world of missions. Um, I, I got uh, I got called to preach when I was about 30 years old, 32 years old. Uh, I had my plan for my life, and uh, I was gonna uh, make a lot of money in the business world and build a nice big house and have you know shoot deer off the porch with a, with a bow, and it was great. You know, it was real spiritual, and I was gonna give all kinds of money to the church and help the preacher out, and I was gonna do all these things and. And we had a revival meeting and God kind of showed me that was my plan. It wasn't his plan. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, God, whatever you want, I'll do. And then uh, three months later, God called me to preach. And I went to Heartland. That's where I met you. And 
Uh, then I took a little church in Washington State and pastored there for almost eight years, and then God called me to the mission field. And that transition, uh, you know, took place. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting. It, the whole thing is a. That's kind of how I got into ended up in, in Zambia, and we really love it. It's a great deal. Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I didn't catch that yesterday. I know we talked about it, but I didn't catch that you you were a pastor for eight years. That's yes. pretty long. Yes. A long time, and then and to just transition and say, "Hey, God called me to." Yeah. Go so, to so going to a country and going to an English speaking country is huge because you know I'm 49 years old, and. Yeah. Um, I, the foreign language is a real struggle for me, but uh, it's an English speaking country. And there's 47 tribal languages, but English is the backbone of the country. And sure. the, the educated people all speak English fluently. Uh, okay. The poorer a person is, the less access to education, the more that they become uh, speaking just those tribal languages. So yeah. we well, do, even, even a poor person, don't they pretty much, I mean, how many languages does the average person speak? Oh, they'll speak four or five or six languages. Yeah. Because they have trade languages, and, yes. and most people probably have a somewhat of an understanding of English. You know, um, they um, do. If you're in the city, if you're in any okay. of the cities, there's almost a, there's almost a hundred percent English. But as you get oh. to the edges of the cities, the poorer areas where there's less access to education for economic reasons, or you get right. into the bush, the the amount of English goes down as a percentage. But you could go pretty much anywhere, I think, in Zambia, and walk into a village pretty much anywhere, and there's going to be somebody there that speaks English. Okay, sure, sure. And, or uh, if there's not, you've got plenty you've of got people your, in this city. Yes, you've got your guys that are translating for you and everything else. Yeah. Well, that's that's great. And so how, how are, uh, I know the majority of the ministry is going to be there in the city. That makes sense. Yes. But how is, uh, I don't think we hit on this at all yesterday, but how, how does going into uh, the bush, I mean, how difficult is that? How, how well received? It's extremely uh, well received. And, They'll and, take you in and, and, and yeah. uh, I'm gonna, be hospitable to you and all that. Yes, very much. And part of that's a good thing and part of it's a bad thing. Um, I've got a friend that's an independent Baptist missionary in, uh, in, a, in a place up north, and he's about four, three hours drive on a gravel road into the bush. And it's in a local chiefdom there. And it's, it's the same things that we deal with in the city. He went into that chiefdom and he, I asked him, I said, how many of the people would you say that you, you've talked to after being there for three years, uh, even had an idea what the gospel was? And his mm -hmm. answer was there was one guy that came from Lusaka that actually went to some church where he got an idea that salvation was by grace. And when, right. it, but the people that live in that village, there's not a single one. But there's an SDA church and there's a Jehovah's Witness church and there's a, you know, there's all these different churches that are there, but they, they all teach works religion. Universal. And they will, they'll influence the tribe, the, out in the bush too. They'll oh, absolutely. Uh, have a on them. Okay. Wow. So you've got, I mean, I've gone into the Islamic learning center and uh, preached to the imams. I've met all of the imams in Zambia that run, run Islam in, in, in Lusaka. I've sat in their offices, uh, had a whole round table of them, and I've gone through the gospel as clear as a bell with every one of them. And, uh, you know, like Paul said, you know, I'm free from the blood, you know, the, the, guilt, the blood on my hands of all these people. And they're as actually callous and hard to the gospel as you could ever imagine. But right. as I'm sitting there and preaching to them, they've got 17 or 18 or 19 motorcycles they just bought brand new, shipped from Dubai, mm -hmm. that their imam trainees are going out into the bush and spreading Islam mm -hmm. village by village in the bush. And, you know, that that kind of kind of breaks my heart because we're not winning. Right. We're right. not winning. We're winning the little battle here that we're trying to reach in this little community here or this little spot here. But the gospel is not winning in Africa. We're, we're, the population is growing faster than we can reach them. The, the, the resources that we have, the manpower that we have is insufficient to even keep up with the population, let alone right. make any really big headway. And well, world, worldwide, I mean, Christianity is the largest religion, but we, you and I know that that is, doesn't mean... <laughs> yeah, Zambia is a Christian nation. And uh, out of 2,700 right. people that came to a medical clinic, there's maybe 50 of them that could actually tell you and give a plausible, this guy might be saved, 
that I am saved by Jesus Christ and by his grace and his blood and his death on the cross paid for my sins. And I'm trusting in that. And it's a free gift. And it's, 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 it, it got after a week of this, of sitting for, you know, 10 hours a day, witnessing to people, thousands of people, literally. And, uh, you know, as many as you could just talk to all day long, it got to be kind of just almost, uh, well, really sad because you'd sit down and people would walk in and they'd say, I'd say, what would it take to be right with God and 100 percent sure you're going to heaven when you die? And they'd say, oh, well, you have to be baptized. You have to keep the commandments. You have to follow the law. You have to be good to your neighbor. You have to pray for people. They give us a list of seven or eight or nine good spiritual things. And they say that. Yeah. Is that, is that pretty much it? Yep. You know, it's funny. You never mentioned this guy. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, him too. Oh, and right. and it's just, it's ingrained in every single church that these works, works, works. And when you tell people that it's not by works, they look at you like you're insane. And they cannot comprehend it. And you show it in the Bible. And they just look at the Bible and they stare at it. And they're like, why haven't I ever heard this? Why, why hasn't anybody told me? And in the capital city of a self-proclaimed Christian nation, every time we go out, I run into somebody, I preach the gospel to them, and I always ask them, I say, have you ever heard this before? That salvation is free, it's, by, it's a gift, it's not by works. And they say, no, I've never heard it before. Not everybody says that, but most people will say that. And how can people say that they're preaching the gospel? I mean, the gospel means good news. It's not good news. Well, <laughs> you have it's, to rely on the word. It's, it's just a perverted gospel. It's the idea yeah. that they're going to get these, that they're going to earn the free gift of God by doing these works. That somehow when they do enough, then Jesus gives them salvation. Right. right. And that's what's been brought over there. That's what's been yeah. propagated. And the, right. cat, the, the biggest right. religions are the Catholics, Seventh day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and then. Um, those are the three largest groups, and uh, all, all three of them are, are well, all three of them don't preach a gospel message. Let's just say that we could call right. them cults, but two of them for sure. But I, I just throw them all in there as false teaching. Right. Sure, sure. Nice. You know, I had a guy, I had a young person one time, and uh, you know, and I mentioned this to you yesterday. But what I found is that people are people, and and it comes down to they either trust, you yeah. know, the the what God said, you know, and trust by faith, uh, the gospel, or else they rely on works, you know, yeah. and they pervert the gospel. They try to find out what works for them. And I had a young guy here that, uh, you know, he just never completely uh, grasped the Bible or, or just uh, even or held on to it. He was always looking for something else, you know. So he started dabbling with different denominations and different beliefs, or he'd say, you know, I I want to take some of that, you know, but I believe some of these things are right or whatever. Right. One day, one day he called me and said, Hey, you're, you're not going to like this, but I actually started reading the uh, book of Satan. <laughs> and, and he's like, and it's really not as crazy as you might think. And he started talking about all this kind of stuff that, that he read in that. Sure. And I said, here's the thing, brother. I said, there's truth and there, there's false. And one leads to heaven, one leads to hell. You could tell me, you know, I became, you know, this cult, part of this cult here, or, or this false gospel over there, or, or a Satanist. And to <laughs> me, there's no difference. You're either right or you're wrong. That's right. You know, and and you know, accept the Bible or you don't. Like, it doesn't seem that crazy to him because he's crazy. And you know, I, <laughs> I had an evangelist tell me one time. He's a friend of mine. He said, "Yeah, I went into the prison and and uh, and he starts witnessing to this guy. He's like, oh, this guy's a Mormon." And then he starts talking to him more. He's like, no, it doesn't sound quite right. No, he's like more like a Jehovah's Witness. And he says, no, it's not quite right. He's kind of like a Baha'i guy. And, and, no, and then he says, ah, he's a blender head. He's just taking little pieces of all of them and put them in the head. And, and then <laughs> that's what you get. Yeah, and looking so then, for something that makes sense in their mind that's instead right. of just accepting what God provided. And so, and so then now, now, yeah, all the stuff, seems, all the stuff that's crazy seems normal. Right, exactly. So, but now having said that, uh, I know that you deal with, now we already talked a little bit about charismatic, but I know you deal with a lot of uh, animist beliefs, witch doctors yes. and stuff like that. Yes. And so if you don't mind, talk about how that relates to 
the culture there, you know, with the, the charismatic movement and uh, that's yeah. the other big group that's there. I, I forgot one, the fourth, that's the charismatic movement. So mm -hmm. the animism, the way it works is this. There's um uh there is a belief, every tribe has a belief in that there is a god. And uh, some call him Malungu, some call him Lesa, based upon the local language and the, the, the word that means God. And uh, they believe that God created everything and that God then left. And uh, um, when he left, he just left the world to operate. And that's called deism. That's what we would call deism. And uh, then the next thing is everything in the world, there's a spiritual world and then there's a physical world. And everything in the spiritual world and the physical world is, we look at it in the West, they're, they're kind of separate. In Africa, they're the same. They, 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 they bleed over. And, you know, we kind of believe they bleed over too, but not to the same extent. In that everything that they see that physically happens is a result of a spiritual cause. So a person okay. gets malaria, we say, well, the mosquito bottom that had bit that person that had a malaria parasite. And they would say, yeah, but why? Why did the mosquito yeah. bite them? The mosquito yeah. bought them, bit them because, bought them, bit them because uh, they're buying it, though. They're buying all this, okay? But the mosquito <laughs> bit them because they disobeyed their ancestor. Their father right. taught them how to farm. The grandfather taught them how to farm. Now they're doing something different. There's innovation. And that innovation is an insult to the ancestors. So the ancestors sent the mosquito to kill their daughter. Or right. somebody in another village uh, is cursing them. And the witch doctors, the, the traditional healers, I'm going to use traditional healers, because we would call them witch doctors. We would say it's all satanic. Uh, but there is right. a positive light. And this will make sense in a minute. The witch doctors use that to control the people. So if they've got somebody they don't like or somebody that's opposing them, uh, well, that preacher over there, he put that curse on you and he caused that mosquito to bite him and he caused that malaria. And But I can give you this powerful magic that will protect you. And um, so they've got that. So the spirits, uh, they believe in ancestral spirits and territorial spirits. So the spirit of grandpa or the spirit of the waterfall or the river or this or that. And those spirits, they control everything. Whether or not your field yields a crop is based on those spirits. Whether or not you prosper, it's based on those spirits. To the extent that in Zambia, most of the businesses are owned by Indians uh, from India. And uh, you go down down Lusaka, it's almost 100% of all of the little shops and the businesses are all owned by Indians. The Zambians don't own them. And when you ask a Zambian about that, they'll say, well, yeah, you got to understand, those guys have very powerful magic. That's how they're able to make money. We don't have that kind of powerful magic. It's not like... It might be. It just might be. I'm just going to go out on a limb. It might be they show up to work on time. They open their shop. They keep it stocked. They're, they're there. They, you know, they follow like these biblical principles. And I'm telling you, it sounds crazy, but this stuff runs deep. And so then you go to the, so then the person to, to control these spirits, they go to the traditional doctor or the witch doctor, the good witch doctor. And he's believed to have power to unlock the things in nature, the leaves, the trees, the, 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 the animals, and all the things in nature have power, latent power existing in these things. And the witch doctor has the power to unlock that. And then he can give you this charm or this fetish and you can wear it around your neck or, or whatever. And it's supposed to impart that magical power to you or that protection or that whatever it is. And um, then there's the malevolent witches. And this comes from a book that was written by an anthropologist in the 1950s. He went to the Luvali tribe and he wrote about their religious system. He was a lost man, but he documented what they believed in their religious system. And uh, this is where I get this. The Zambian people, as a general rule, will not tell you, Africans, I think, as a general rule, will not tell a white person these things because it's considered a taboo and... You can see if some British guy was there 50 years ago during colonial times, he just dismissed this as, as foolishness. And so right. it's, it's a closely held belief that lies beneath the surface that you don't really access unless you do, a, you know, unless somebody opens up and tells you or you read it or find out some other way. And they said that they said in this Luvali tribe, there's spirits that possess these women, these witches. These are the legitimate bad. Everybody in Zambia hates them witches. And okay. when that woman dies, that spirit jumps to one of her daughters or one of her nieces. And it's an involuntary demonic possession. He didn't say demonic. I'll say demonic because that's what it is. And he, he documented this, that there was this spirit that would possess them. And, and the men would take little figurines and rub blood in it. And they would uh, then they'd become possessed by a spirit and become like a warlock. 
And uh, mm -hmm. they do this to control people and to, you know, all the nefarious bad reasons. Yeah. And this is what's crazy, okay? You know, you read that, and immediately you and I would think, well, yeah, some backwards people in some bush tribe that aren't does, don't have access to education, they believe that. But the people in the city don't believe that. Wrong. And when we were there one year, one year there, they had four murders, and those were all ritual killings where they were the people were killed, and they were just randomly picked. Uh, a guy in a shop hires a witch doctor, and the witch doctor says, you got to bring me so many of this part, so many of these parts, so many of these parts off of a human being. Then they go out and spend a $500 or $1,000 to have a, hire a couple of guys to go kill these people. And they take their knives and dismember the bodies and take all of the parts they want and bring them in a jar to the witch doctor. And the witch doctor does his little magic, and it's supposed to make their shops prosper. Well, right. the police finally caught these guys, and the shop, I'm, I'm, the shop that they caught them in was literally, the church was right here the, across the street. And then right on the other side of the street, three shops down, that's where it was. And I'd walked into mm -hmm. that shop, giving them tracks, witness to them. And, you know, you're, you're, it's, it's right there. And then, and then they found the killers. Okay, they found these guys that killed them. They found the people that hired them to be killed. And the people that hired them to be killed were all university educated. You know, one guy was, was an officer in the military. Uh, you know, another guy was a professional. I mean, these were all professional mm -hmm. people in the capital city. Right. And then the and then the police, when they go to find him, they're like, we really can't find these people. So let's hire one of the good witches to do magic to lead us to the uh, killers. And the story on the street is, I don't know how true it is, but the story on the street is that's how they found the killers. Right, right. And uh, uh, so, so, so it's not just so it's not just that they uh, uh, are trying to make money by doing this stuff. They really believe. They really but believe it, and, and there, and I, and I would say this: I would you're say saying there, even educated, most educated among. Yeah. yeah, I would say there is probably some truth to the legitimacy of it. I would yeah, not. Right. Dis, I would not immediately just discount that this is just some belief. Uh, I, I believe that there is a power of Satan, and I believe that Satan can can uh, provide financial benefits and signs and wonders and miracles. And the Bible says, of course, that in the last days that the world's going to be deceived by signs, wonders, lying signs and wonders. And, um, you know, people, people are going to follow the devil. The devil's the God of this world. And he can, he can allocate his world to whoever he will. Just as he said to Jesus, I can give you this world. Jesus didn't say, no, you can't. This is mine. He said, no, right. he, he didn't say that. And so it's, it's a, it's, it's a dark place. There's a lot of, it's a, it's a dichotomy. It's a mix. There's a darkness, there's poverty, there's, there's, there's horrific abuse. There's, there's a, uh, I mean, we just had a, a man beat his wife to death with a, with a, a wooden stick about a, an enshima stick. And they're, they're a pretty stout stick. They use it to mix the, the mealy meal and the enshima they cook, beat her to death because he was drunk and he, he she didn't cook the meal right. So she, he killed her. And this was just last week in Lusaka. And the, 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 the abuse, and the, there's so, so on one side, I could talk to you about the very dark, dark sure. elements of the society. But then on this side, they're happy. They're some of the most sure. joyful people you ever meet. They're the kindest yeah. people you've ever met. They're, they're, they, they, they value relationships, and we have deep, deep, deep relationships with some of the people in church, especially the young men that we're teaching. And... Um, uh, rich relationships, the likes of which you don't normally develop in the United States without five, 10, 15 years of knowing somebody. And right. um, so it, it, it's a dichotomy. It's a mix. Well, that's an interesting thought because, you know, in, in the United States, of course, we're not dealing with, you know, we don't necessarily think that we can see the demon possession and everything. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to, to think that, um, just the power, uh, the power of Satan, you know, uh, but, but then at the same time, not everybody, we know a lot of people, I mean, a majority aren't saved, but not everybody's just this, you know, given over to Satan, reprobate, you know, just wicked person. Yeah. Most people, it's... most people are just searching for, you know, they're just trying to live their life and they're not bad, bad people in that sense. Right. We know so, all our sins, but... Okay. So here's, here's yeah. an example. So you, you have a child in Zambia, a person has a child, and the child's born with a defect. You know, the arm is, is, is twisted or something. There's a, a birth defect. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon for them, especially if they live in a rural or in the bush, to just take that child out and leave it in the bush to die of exposure. 
and oh, wow. and you think, well, that's just de just demonic. Yeah. yeah, but in America, what are we talking about now? Oh, we did an abortion and it failed, so we'll just take the child and we'll just uh, kill it. Yeah. And you right. got everybody clapping in New York and all these states. Well, yeah. what do you call that? It's demonic. Yeah. Keeps going back to this. <laughs> we're all we're all the same people. Adam it's and the Eve. Same. You know, descendants of Adam and Eve. Yeah, and and you know the the civilized West is is just as barbaric and just as uh, heathen as the people yeah. in the dark parts of Africa, and maybe even more so. Right. Yeah. Well, and because at, at least a lot of those people aren't totally cut off to spiritual things. I mean, That's here right. it seems like a lot of people have just dismissed them themselves to right. anything spiritual and they so just live in the second world. Does Satan really need to do much in the United States? People have already right. thrown the Bible out, dismissed the spiritual and right. said, we don't believe it. And it's all superstition. Right. And it's kind of like, well, our work's here is done. Let's, let's go over there. And right. it's, it's a culture that's ruled by fear in every right. area. And so, the, the woman that goes to bed in fear that she's done something this day that will cause a spirit to come in, an ancestral spirit to come in and kill her child or some right. other n neighbor lady will get mad at her. I'm going to curse you. And she goes to bed afraid in legitimate fear that her child's going to die. And right. really, I think a lot of that is just due to the high child mortality and the um, mm -hmm. lack of access to health care and the lack of medical knowledge that there's just a fear, but that fear is stoked by the witch doctors and it's stoked by the Pentecostals. And uh, so then what's happened is Christianity comes and immediately you know, Jesus can come and set you free from the spiritual, you know, this, the, the, you know, the, you know, from all of this spiritual. And then, so the Zambian hears, oh, this is how I'm going to get my crops to grow. Right. It's because another all good luck. Spirits. <laughs> and I've yeah. been dealing with the witch doctor and he's like here, but I can deal directly with God. And God can help me make, control these spirits. This is a great deal. And so immediately there's a receptiveness that I believe can easily be mistaken because the motives are wrong. The motive is not right. I'm coming to Christ because I'm a sinner and I'm going to go to hell. It's I'm coming to Christ because Christ has power to control right. these ancestral spirits and make my crops yield. Which, yeah. when you think about it, isn't that like the fundamental basis of Pentecostalism? You go sure. because God's going to bless you with health, wealth, and prosperity. And you're going yeah. to get the things of the world from God rather than to learn to yeah. get God and forsake the things and, of the world. And then you live in fear. And then that causes you to be dependent on these multi-millionaire leaders. Absolutely. That are, that are so so the yeah. Pentecostals have come in and really capitalized on this and built big churches mm -hmm. because their uh, worldview matches the exact worldview of animism. So now right. instead of going to the instead of the instead of the ancestral spirits, it's the demonic spirits. So the reason mm -hmm. I'm an alcoholic is because the spirit of alcoholism. The reason I beat sure. my wife is I've got the spirit of abuse. Uh, the reason yeah. I've got this yeah. is it's the spirit. It's not my fault. It's not because I'm just a dirty, rotten sinner. You gotta understand, right. I'm a pretty good guy. It's all these demons. So every single church, prophecy, deliverance, miracles on every practically every single church and then when they say deliverance it means i'm going there and they have the power to remove the demon of alcohol so that i won't be a drunk anymore mm -hmm. and it has nothing to do with deliverance in the bible because we've studied this and that is deliverance from sin by the power of jesus christ on the cross it's completely sure. corrupted so now the good witch doctor becomes the pastor the pastor has to do miracles to prove he's got the power to control the demons and right. the whole thing, they've got guys selling brooms to sweep away your problems. They've got guys there selling holy water, anointing oil, and all of these charms and fetishes. Right. Just like the witch doctor. And the people hold them just like the witch doctor. So they get saved by going to this church and getting baptized or doing some work. And before, the woman would go to bed terrified that some ancestral spirit's going to kill her child. And now, after the incredible liberating power of the fake churches, she goes to bed terrified that some demon's going to kill her child. Right. And there's no change. They're still in bondage. Well, and, and if they've grown in that, that culture their whole life, you know, maybe another good question for me to ask you is, obviously, we know when somebody truly gets saved, the Holy Spirit guides them into all truth and, and what have you. 
I'm sure you see a lot of people who come to the church or whatever, and they're just hoping for this superficial thing. But then you're going to, on the other hand, see some lives change and, and really see the drastic, you know, yeah. change where they're relying on the spirit and not, um, uh, you know, living in fear or what have yeah, absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it, it takes time and it's like it does in the United States, but there's a lady there. She's 60 years old. Her name is Agnes. And she, I believe she was saved when we found her. She was going to a Baptist church and my wife's mm -hmm. been discipling her every, every Saturday. And, um, she is growing in, in her knowledge of Jesus Christ. Like she's never grown before. She's been in a Baptist church for 20 years. She had no idea what eternal security was. She had no idea uh, about the, the, the basic things that that you or I would try to establish in the life of a new believer in the first year she's never gotten. And mm -hmm. so what happens is the, the, there is a lack of, of really understanding how to exposit the word of God and how to preach the word of God. And there's a lot of guys that want to be preachers because it's a job and they make money. There's some guys out there that are sincere and they really want to see lives changed. But the ones that are sincere don't have access to the materials and the books and the the knowledge of how to put a sermon together so it's the the young men you know and i can tell you stories about some of the young men uh, when we started the teaching them in the bible college we 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 we, we did a test we, we want to see what grade level they're at and most of them are fourth fifth sixth seventh grade reading level and that's and we've got people that are you got a university education that are at sixth grade reading level so right. you know it's Africa is a tragedy. The whole continent is a tragedy. And the sure. corruption and the um, mismanagement of funds, mismanagement of resources for the benefit of the individual rather than the benefit of the country is so great that you take the average African country, if they have a public school, the, there's 60 to 80 kids in that public school class. Mm -hmm. And they got mm -hmm. one dictionary. And they'll take that dictionary and, okay, class, here's the dictionary. See this? And you got 60 kids out there. How in the world can they even see that dictionary? And our Bible college is the first time they ever touched a dictionary is when we put one in their hands. Oh, wow. They've never touched one in their life. Um, never seen a concordance. Never seen, you know, so these things just, there, there's so many lack. There's so many things that are lacking that, that we're mm -hmm. adding. And we're, we're, we're doing grammar classes. We're doing sentence structure classes. We're doing a lot of English teaching to get them up to a level to where, because if I could get them, if I could get them to a 10th grade reading level, Imagine what that would do to their understanding of the scripture. Sure. sure. It's, it's just, so, I mean, accepting salvation is, it doesn't take, require a lot of no, education. I'm but you have to hear the message. Children. But then to get them to help disciple other people or right. to be disciples, they, they've got to increase their their yeah. their knowledge. And yeah, that's We, a, we had a young man, uh, one of the first men that really came in and got established in church. His name's Donald. And, um, he was Jehovah's Witness. He, he was from a Jehovah's Witness background. And uh, he had a bad relationship with his parents. So I think that kind of severed the Jehovah's Witness link. But he didn't believe Jesus was God. And uh, he came to church one day and I went over to his house and I visited him. And I opened up the scripture and showed him where Jesus was God. And for the first time in his life, he saw that, started to believe that Jesus was actually God. And three weeks later, he came down to the altar. I need to get saved. And um, it's amazing to watch him because... He's growing in wisdom. He's growing in the depth of understanding. And he's reading books that I'm not teaching him, and he's understanding them. And he, and he comes back and says, this makes sense to me now, Pastor. I understand it. And he came to me one time, and he said, "For the first, he says, I'm starting to realize everybody I know is lost. And yeah. that loneliness is kind of, you know, that loneliness that he then experiences develops that relationship with us and the other people right. in church. And you see God starting to create a community that sees the world the way God sees it. And, yeah, that's and, scriptural and, word. And and that's the foundation love, for love missions. The, love of the brethren. Yeah, yeah, and that's the foundation for missions. Uh, another yeah, young man, man Jolus, he was taught that he had to submit and surrender his life to be saved. And he had to, you know, and then he came and he, he actually then realized he had to receive Christ to be saved. And then after mm -hmm. he gets saved, he needs to submit his life. And he's from Burundi. Mm -hmm. And um, he survived the genocide there. His whole family, his, his family's all dead. They were all killed during the Burundian genocide during the times in the 90s from Rwanda. And uh, he wants to go back to Burundi. And he's got he's scars got, in the back of his neck. He's got a big scar from a machete Yeah, he's got something. like big scars in the back of his neck. He was four years old. Yeah. They, they went to cut his head off with a machete and they left him for dead. And somehow God kept him alive and he survived. He doesn't remember it. 
thank God he doesn't remember it. Um, and he's very freely to talk about it because, you know, it was when he was young. It's kind of like, you know, that's four-year-old time. It, you get detached from it in a lot of ways. But he is on fire for God. He preached a message at our midweek service this week. And my wife said he did a fantastic job. And um, he's growing in his depth and understanding. And he's, he's preaching. My daughter, my nine-year-old daughter, grabbed some new kid that had come and said, Do you know how to be saved? Has anybody told you how to get saved? Starts trying to tell her. And so then they got her, got her into Jolus. And Jolus led that boy. His name's Ryan. Led him to Christ this week. I just I don't know if I got that on the last week because I just got that message. But um so we see things like that. Uh, a man named Harrington, I went in and wanted to get some cinnamon rolls. They don't have cinnamon rolls there. So I went into this little bakery, gas station, quickie mart place and asked them if they'd ever made cinnamon rolls. They said, no, I said, I'll teach you how. And so they, they what are you gonna charge us? No, I'll just, just come and teach you how. So we made a plan. I went there one Saturday and went in the back and showed them how to make cinnamon rolls. And um, we made a big batch, two or three flats of cinnamon rolls. And they asked me, so are you a baker? No, I'm a preacher. Well, how do you know how to bake? Because I like to eat. So if I like to eat, then you learn to bake, right? And uh, I met this man named Harrington. And he just really had a zeal for God and really wanted to know God. And was kind of disappointed with the church he was going to because they, 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 they were doing some things that even he could see was wrong. He started coming to church and his wife came with him. His family came with him. They've got a bunch of kids that they've just adopted because they're just, you know, kids that needed a home. And um, he came to church, was translating for me one Sunday. And he came to me after he translated and said, Pastor, I need to get saved. I'm lost. And he got saved and stood up in front of the church. I've been trusting all these different things. And I today learned I have to trust Christ. And his wife is this close to getting saved. And so Betty is her name. And uh, we just pray that she'll uh, that she'll get saved. She said that she, she needs to get saved. And, uh, and we hope that happens. And so, but we're seeing this. Uh, two years ago when I came back for a short trip like this, I had to bring a guy in to preach for me. This year, uh, when I came, two years later, there's seven men from our church that want to preach. And um, that's a blessing. And um, it's, it's really exciting to see that. Well, so you're here for about two months, I guess. Yes, sir. And, and uh, you have one meeting, one meeting open, and we, and we snatched it up. So. Yeah, and I'm, I'm excited to come <laughs> and see you. We're looking forward to talking to you in April. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more stories, and and uh, and I'll talk to you more about that. Okay. And so we'll we'll set up all those all, all those things. But brother, I sure appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to do this, and Not I can't wait to share it with our yeah I'll share it with our folks. And if you don't mind, uh, I'll put it on on my Facebook and sure. and YouTube and not a problem. And, uh, no, some missionaries they can't get their name out there, but. Zambia is uh, well, pretty we're open. a Christian nation, so everybody loves it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing that and, and talking more with you later. So, all right. Thank you so much for your time and thank your, your sending pastor for helping us set this up. And I will. All right. Well, I'm going to talk to you later then. All right. God and bless we'll you, Brother Rocky. All right.